Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Planning and Executing a Successful Industrial Hygiene Program. We're glad you could join us. My name is James, I run webinars and events here at Triumvirate and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items before we get to today's presentation, uh, so bear with me as we list these out here. Um, you'll note that your line is muted. Um, we ask that you please communicate via the questions pane over on the right-hand side of your screen. You can ask questions anytime throughout the webinar. In fact, if we get some on the early side, we, we may take a couple of pauses to, to get to those questions. Also, let us know if there are any technical issues. If you have any trouble hearing us, um, please let us know and we'll try and resolve that. Uh, any unanswered questions will be followed up on after the webinar in the coming days, uh, and we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end there to take care of those. Finally, you will receive a copy of today's slide deck and the recording in an email tomorrow morning. So you will get all of these materials that are presented today. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Mark Liffers. Mark is Practice Director of EHS Consulting here at Triumvirate, where he provides on-site technical support and outsourced program management to a wide range of technology-based research, manufacturing, and construction clients. His areas of, of technical expertise include biosafety, industrial hygiene, occupational health and safety, radiation safety, among others. Mark has a Master of Science degree in Industrial Hygiene from the Harvard School of Public Health. And with that, I'll turn things over to Mark. Hey, Mark. Oh, hey, James. Hey, thanks much. And uh, welcome, everybody. I, I'm kind of, uh, kind of happy to be able to uh, uh, give this webinar. Uh, just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I, I got into this field way back in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, my undergrad is in biological sciences. I've uh, spent most of my most of my time in and out of uh, the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, some high tech and aerospace. But uh, but by and large, uh, you know, bio, uh, biologic and uh, and pharmaceutical. I've been a, a biosafety officer, a radiation safety officer, chemical hygiene officer. Uh, uh, responsible official for select agent programs, so uh, I, I guess you can see I've been around the block uh, a couple of times. But anyway, uh, today's today's presentation is going to be, uh, I would say, a bit of a, a higher level look at industrial hygiene and industrial hygiene programs, and uh, some thoughts as to uh, ways to put together a program and uh, and make it make it effective and make it make it efficient. I like to remind folks that industrial hygiene, uh, as defined by the American Industrial Hygiene Association, is a science and art devoted to the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, prevention, and control of environmental factors or stresses uh, arising in or from the workplace. And really anything that can cause sickness, impaired health, and well-being uh, among our workers. And when we are working in industrial hygiene, really what we're trying to do is uh, recognize, evaluate, and control uh, the factors that we can control that are going to affect people's health. <clears throat> so a little bit of our talk today, uh, we'll talk about why an IH program is needed. Uh, you're going to see there's regulatory reasons, uh, best practice reasons, other reasons for that. Um, some of the essential parts and pieces of an IH program. Uh, how do you get started? You know, some thoughts on uh, how do we how do we pick what we want to look at and prioritize those things. Uh, roles and responsibilities. It's not just a person who's wearing an IH hat uh, that needs to be managing uh, or or creating, for that matter, an IH program. Uh, then I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, some concepts of chemical exposure monitoring. Uh, I think typically when somebody mentions, oh, I'm uh, managing an IH program, uh, we think it's just chemical monitoring. It's a big piece of it, uh, but it's not certainly not, uh, you know, not the end all for industrial hygiene. And then, and then we'll have a, a sum up and some questions and answers. Throughout the presentation, uh, there's a few slides where uh, we're going to just ask you a polling question, and uh, James will uh, get that information, and he'll run into the room here with me and let me know what the, uh, the poll results are. So we'll have a little, little bit of that going on as well. <clears throat> Why is an IH program needed? Good, uh, good question. Uh, 
Um, I think a lot of people, when we talk about industrial hygiene, why we want to have an industrial hygiene program is regulatory compliance. Certainly that's the easiest thing to sell to our bosses. Hey, I have to, I have to do it because OSHA requires it. And out of the, uh, what you see here is just a, just a summary of OSHA's general industry standards. Uh, all the subparts, walking and working surfaces, etc. cetera. Uh, there's an industrial uh, you know, counterpart to that. But if you look at the bolded standards, all of these really have an industrial hygiene component to it. Uh, ergonomics, uh, injuries, uh, assessments, uh, occupational health and environmental control, uh, hazardous material management, uh, an emergency response, personal protective equipment. Uh, we cannot give someone uh, personal protective equipment, at least the right personal protective equipment, until we've done uh, a PPE assessment or a risk assessment to know what we're protecting them against. And that can be chemical splash hazards, it can be heat, it can be noise, uh, it can be respirators for respiratory protection. Uh, so uh, the PPE subpart really has a big IH component to that. General environmental controls, ventilation, medical first aid, and uh, you know, emergency response. Uh, breathing air. We don't think about it, but people who are uh, wearing air supplied respirators uh, or even, uh, say, working in a pressurized environment like caisson workers, uh, we're dealing with compressed air and the quality of that. Welding, cutting, brazing. We all know uh, if someone's doing welding or cutting, uh, especially on stainless, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking uh, you know, for the metals in the fume and uh, especially uh, chromium. And then there's, there's subpart Z. This is, uh, uh, for you folks who might not be familiar, this is where OSHA lists, oh, was it 600 or some odd uh, chemicals that have a specific permissible exposure uh, limit. And uh, a, another uh, subset of, of chemicals have a specific standard associated with them. So if I'm working with something like uh, uh, benzene or toluene, I, I, I'll have my subpart Z OSHA PEL that I need to be in compliance with. So, so really all of these things are the regulatory drivers for an industrial hygiene program. <clears throat> in addition to the regulatory requirements, uh, we have our, our non-regulatory standards uh, and guidelines. Um, I think probably the, uh, the most common one that we're all familiar with is the ACGIH, or American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienist uh, threshold, limit, threshold Limit Values, or TLVs. Uh, and these are probably the most up-to-date consensus standards that we have uh, to uh, uh, compare our exposures against. Don't forget that the OSHA permissible exposure limits are, are pretty dated. Uh, they were brought into being when, back when OSHA was created, uh, have had some limited updates since then, but uh, the ACGIH TLVs are, are really the, uh, uh, the standards. Then we have our NIOSH recommended exposure le uh, levels or limits, uh, similar to the TLVs uh, that are good practical guidance. And don't forget industry best practices. Uh, the pharmaceutical and the chemical industries have really done a good job over the years establish, establishing what they call occupational exposure limits for uh, in-house chemicals uh, or pharmaceuticals, active pharmaceutical ingredients for which there is no uh, TLV or PEL. And these are real important for us to uh, uh, be, be looking at when we're in that type of an, envir of an environment. And other standards, the uh, uh, International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> acceptable daily exposure limits. These are uh, basically uh, dose limits to uh, give us something, uh, especially when we're cleaning uh, manufacturing equipment or other types of uh, equipment where we could have cross-contamination. Uh, to see if there's a surface contamination level that we need to be controlling against. So uh, we're seeing more and more uh, movement in that area as well. Then our other folks who are interested, uh, our workers' comp carriers for sure, are interested in what our employee exposures are, <coughs> oh, excuse me, and uh, even liability insurance carriers. Don't forget that uh, uh, if we have a construction operation, 
uh, we're generating fumes or dusts or even noise. Uh, we have fence line exposures that people are going to be concerned about uh, from, a, from a community perspective. So uh, just from that regulatory and non-regulatory perspective, we have lots and lots to be looking at when we're looking at uh, different physical agents and different chemical agents. Something that's not particularly regulated, uh, public relations. This is a slide of a fairly recent uh, series of articles that uh, came out uh, when some Samsung workers, uh, and Samsung is a big component supplier to Apple, uh, thought that the employer, their employer had been withholding information about the chemicals that uh, their employees were being exposed to while, while working in the, in the company's factories. Uh, most or virtually all of the exposures were, were within limits, but it was a, a communications issue uh, with, with those workers. Uh, that got a lot of fanfare and uh, certainly didn't make Apple or uh, Samsung look very good in this, uh, in this instance. Whoops. <clears throat> oh, we have a poll question. All right, so uh, the question is, how would you describe your industrial hygiene program? Uh, so if you could uh, tick off your responses, uh, James is going to open the poll and uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes he will tally it up. He'll run over here and give me the information, and we'll be able to uh, uh, see how you describe your IH program. All right. Looks like a lot of you are getting your responses in. I will share those in just a few seconds. Give everyone a, a little bit more time here. You see the options there. We have. Uh, we don't have one. We're in the early stages and are developing one now. We have a mature program in place, but it needs some help. And then finally, a top top notch, fully functional program there at the end. Um, so at this point, I will close down this poll, and I'm going to share those results. And Mark, it looks like a very close race. So early stage <laughs> developing one now came in at 44%, and then next, no kidding. next right. 40%, we have mature program in place, but it needs some help. And uh, only 10% say that they have a, a top-notch, fully functional program at this time. Oh, excellent, excellent. All right, so we got people either developing their program or they get a, uh, an existing program that, that needs a little bit of help. That really doesn't surprise me from what I've seen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty typical. So anyway, uh, if, when we are going to be, uh, say we're starting from scratch. I've got a brand new company and uh, uh, I'm, I'm working with, actually it's a, a pharmaceutical manufacturer now that's uh, uh, kind of in this, in this situation. Brand new company, what are we going to do? Where do we want to be? Do we want to be best in class? Do we want to just meet the legal, our legal obligations? Uh, do we want to have it specific to a particular site or location or country? Um, or do we want to set a, uh, a global worldwide limit? Um, you might think it's pretty easy to define the purpose, but this takes a bit of discussion and effort uh, with your team with your management. Obviously, there's cost implications. You know, if I want to have a, if I want to have a global, world-class uh, safety or industrial hygiene program, it's going to it's going to take a bit more to to implement. But so you want to take a look at you know at uh, how you're going to define the program. Then we want to look at the scope of our program. A lot of companies these days may have a, a small centralized uh, corporate office with some R&D activities. Uh, the manufacturing may be outsourced to other locations or other countries. Uh, do you want it to, to apply only to your actual locations or do you want it to apply to your subcontractor operations? Do you want to extend you know, your uh, not so much control but interest in how they're doing that? Uh, so you want to think of you know, the scope, uh, how narrow or how how broad is that going to be? And then let's look at the program elements within an industrial hygiene program. Uh, just remember, this is really any type of environmental stressor that can affect people. Uh, we can have biological agents, bloodborne pathogens. Uh, we all know that if, I, if we have confined spaces, I need to assess you know, the hazards within that space, uh, noise, uh, am I communicating hazards? Do I do work with a, a, an OSHA 
uh, substance, something that's specifically regulated by OSHA. If I'm a, uh, if I have a business that uh, paints bridges, for example, I'm really going to be interested in what? Probably chrome and lead uh, that can be in some of the constituents of that paint. PPE, uh, particularly respiratory protection. Physical agents, ionizing radiation, do I work with, with radioisotopes? Do I have, uh, say, an irradiator? Or, uh, or am I working with non-ionizing radiation? You know, hot, sor uh, hot sources, uh, heat sources. Optical radiation, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, am I working with lasers, for example? Um, with a lot of controls and assessment that could be needed. Uh, within biological safety, not just the OSHA bloodborne pathogens, but uh, biological safety. Am I working with toxins? Am I working with, uh, with other types of agents? Ergonomics can have a significant uh, impact to an organization. And not just office ergonomics, I can have people in uh, operating machinery, driving trucks, uh, uh, doing different types of work, hot and cold environments. Um, I had a company that uh, had a large, uh, it was a big distribution facility. Uh, it uh, distributed frozen foods and, uh, and meats, a very big facility, had, had a big uh, cold stress program for that operation. And then uh, emergency response. Does your operation have uh, an emergency response component to that? Do you have people who might be subject to those requirements? And how do you do a, uh, a quick and dirty health and safety uh, plan? Uh, how do you assess uh, exposures during an emergency response for your people? We have unusual work schedules. Uh, we don't think of it you particularly. Most people are on a, uh, on a nine to five or a first or second shift, but we have people with uh, two days on, three days off uh, type of a schedule. Uh, electromagnetic fields, uh, issues for folks uh, with NMRs and, and other types of instrumentation. Uh, high or low pressure environments. Uh, I had a job where <clears throat> uh, people would go into a ship and they had to uh, change out uh, transponders in a transponder well that was at the base of the hull of the ship. And the to change the transponder, uh, they'd have to take a plate off the bottom of the hull. And anytime you open up a hole in the bottom of a ship, not a good, uh, not a good thing. So they would pressurize the chamber where these people would be doing that work uh, to allow them to do that. And and uh, there there are lots and lots more. But just to let you know that when you're considering your IH program, it's not just monitoring for chemical exposures, which is a big component, but you need to be thinking about all these other elements and how they relate and uh, which ones are important enough to be brought into your program. So with that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how do we get started? Okay, I've got my world of things that I'm going to be thinking about. How do I know what's important, what's not important? What should I, what should I be uh, thinking about with my program? What are my actual and potential issues of concern? Uh, and, and what does my management want? You know, what does, uh, you know, what does the leadership of the company want? And then finally, what are the, the IH and environmental health and safety norms for my particular industry? Uh, if I'm a company that puts up cell towers, I'm probably going to be interested in electromagnetic fields and radiation. I'm probably not going to be... Uh, as, as interested in some of the other aspects uh, that I could put into my program. So I need to define my priority issues. Uh, and I would do what's called a baseline exposure assessment. This is a qualitative walk around typically. Uh, I need to understand what's going on in my business, uh, write them down, get a sense of what I think is important uh, because once I've uh, developed my list, I'm going to go out and assess and see what it actually is. But typically you can get a good feel qualitatively walking through an operation, walking through a business, uh, and you'll see what my priority issues are. If I were to walk through a laboratory environment and I see people working with uh, formaldehyde, say, uh, for some tissue fixing or uh, methylene chloride, uh, either for use as a solvent or a reagent. Okay, that's a no-brainer. Uh, OSHA you know, requires baseline assessments for those. If I go through an area and it's noisy or it's hot, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to notice that. 
Um, so I'll queue up my list of uh, you know the aspects of my operation, and then <clears throat> I'm going to need to rate my my exposures or my impacts. And to do that, you, and you can come up with these on your own, or you can go online. There's there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, I need to have some sort of a rating where I need to determine, okay, for this this agent. Uh, or, or, or whatever it is my people are going to be exposed to. Uh, do I have really no contact with it, no exposure to it? Uh, do I think I might be near an exposure limit? Uh, do you think I might be over an exposure limit? And give it a simple ranking scale. So obviously, if I have uh, methylene chloride, it's sealed in a drum. No one ever opens the drum. No one ever has contact with it. Okay, I get no exposure. It's going to be a zero in my rating scheme, so not a big deal. If my drum of methylene chloride, for some reason, uh, is a drum that uh, has an open top and people dip buckets into it to take out the methylene chloride uh, with no ventilation, obviously that would be a, a very high potential exposure. Uh, so I'd want to be, I'd want to be ranking, the, ranking it accordingly. Health effects. Uh, again, if I'm working with an agent that has uh, no known uh, or suspect adverse health effects, I'm going to give it a low rating, uh, all the way up to something that's, that's life-threatening or, uh, uh, you know, could give me some sort of an irreversible injury or illness. So uh, uh, I'd want to have a, some kind of a health effect rating on that, on that one. And then a frequency rating. If I have my drum of methylene chloride, um, and I only pop the top off it once every five years, uh, it's going to have a very low frequency rating. But if it's something I do daily uh, or weekly, I'm going to have a high frequency rating to that. So in this, in this simple system where I have my exposure rating, my health effects rating, and my frequency rating, even from a qualitative basis, I can get a pretty darn good feel for what my exposures, uh, what my significant issues are, are going to be. And that will help me uh, you know, to assign an overall risk ranking to these exposures. And then I can start saying, okay, I'm going to start off with my formaldehyde. People are using it every day. Um, I'm going to need to assess that and see what, uh, what, I, what I need to do. So in our risk ranking matrix, and uh, again, you'll see different types of these um, everywhere. And you should really tailor it to what your operation is. If I have, uh, again, a methylene chloride in this example uh, and a nuisance dust, my methylene chloride is giving me a three for exposure, a three for health and a four for frequency, and I multiply them all together, it's going to give me a high relative ranking. If my other exposure was a nuisance dust, uh, a low toxicity, uh, basically nuisance particulate dust uh, with a low exposure potential, a low health effect, but a pretty, pretty high relative frequency, I'm going to get a low number for that. So that would be low in my my list of, of actions. And what did we say we were going to prioritize in our system? Uh, basically, that anything that's uh, like an 11 or 12 or higher, we're going to give it a high priority, which means we're going to take some active uh, steps to assess that exposure. And you will typically see people setting up these risk ranking matrices uh, initially um, to help them get a feel you know, for what their priority issues are, priority hazards are. And again, they can be chemical, they can be physical. Um, we just used a, a couple of chemical examples in this one for the presentation. But you can uh, you know, get a pretty good, pretty good handle on that. So once I've, I've gotten my, my number, I'm going to prioritize my uh, quantitative evaluations uh, or monitoring. Um, or, or maybe some things are so obvious uh, that I would want to put in some type of a control, either administrative or engineering, uh, before I even try some monitoring. You know, if I had a case where an open bucket of methylene chloride, no ventilation, you know, it makes sense to put in the ventilation as soon as you can and then monitor to see uh, how effective it is. We want to communicate these risks, risks and their relative uh, ranking to our line management and effective employees, so they'll know what the uh, primary hazards are and uh, be working with us to uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, the potential effects of that. And also 
what we want to do is try to characterize similar exposure groups in a work area. Uh, it makes a lot of sense if I can say I've got three groups very similar, uh, similar work operations, similar exposure, similar agents. Uh, I'll probably assess and monitor uh, the group that I think, if there is any difference, the group that has the highest potential for, for exposure and then uh, basically assume that the other groups are, are in a similar state, at least initially you know, when, we're, when we're, going, uh, we're getting this thing started. So our plan already, uh, we've got goals, uh, excuse me, we've got scope. Uh, we've identified our rel at least our relative risk on a qualitative basis. Uh, now we need to talk about establishing goals and objectives for the staff and the or line organization. Uh, identify some responsibilities and time frames for completion. Uh, these days, uh, especially with the instrumentation and uh, technology we have available, we, we don't necessarily need to have a, uh, a certified industrial hygienist or, a, or an EHS person uh, do all aspects of the, of the uh, sampling. You can uh, develop a sampling plan. You can give employees and supervisors instructions and worksheets on how to uh, put on a dosimeter, how to record the information, take it off. We can, we can provide oversight to that so we can spread out our goals and duties amongst the organization. Our plan needs to be communicated, uh, again, through the folks that are working there. Everybody will want to know what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, what the results are. And when we do start to get our information back, we need to communicate that to our, our management team. Uh, in many cases, we may need some, some money for additional uh, controls. Uh, we might need to set up some administrative changes. We might need to uh, be making some physical changes to the facility. So we need to uh, be considering that as well. So now we'll look a little bit about uh, some of the roles and responsibilities. But first, we have another poll question. And uh, this one is, are you responsible for more than industrial hygiene at your facility? And uh, James has opened the poll. So we want to see uh, if you're responsible for more than IH. And what does that mean? Are you overall EHS? Uh, do you have safety responsibilities, environmental responsibilities, uh, security responsibilities? And we'll, we'll, my thought is, people typically have more than just industrial responsibility at uh, facilities these days. Yeah, thanks for teeing that up, Mark. And uh, I think you're right. I'm going to close this poll and share the results, but you'll see here that um, 95, 94% said yes, uh, I'm responsible for more than just industrial hygiene. Um, so you're right. Yeah, and, and that, that's, what, that's what we're seeing. You know, IH, um, you know, back in the day, it, it used to be a, an organization would have a safety staff, an environmental staff. It was big enough, maybe an industrial hygiene staff. Uh, these days, people are really uh, generalists. You'll have an EHS person who's going to be responsible for uh, safety, environmental compliance, OSHA compliance, conducting IH assessments and monitoring. Uh, it makes it difficult because you're expected to do uh, an awful lot typically with some limited resources, and maybe you just don't have, you know, the expertise in a particular field. Uh, not that you're not capable of doing it, you just haven't had the experience and you haven't had maybe some of the training to do it. So that's, that's something we run into all the time. But roles and responsibilities with any program, and we can apply this to IH, um, I, I think many of you have, have seen this, probably know it pretty well. Uh, if you have any kind of an ISO uh, registration or certification, um, you'll, you'll know this, uh, that senior management has ultimate responsibility and accountability, sets policy and guidance. The big thing I like senior managers for is that they provide human and financial resources to get stuff done. And our job typically is to show them what it is we need and why we need it and how we can provide that service uh, efficiently and, and effectively. In an IH program, you need somebody with some technical ability to at least help get that program developed. 
uh, could be a, an IH, could be a certified industrial hygienist, could be a certified safety professional, could be uh, uh, a, a certified hazardous material manager. Uh, anybody who's got the, the enough training and knows what needs to be done uh, to put the program together. And uh, don't, be af don't be afraid to reach out to your colleagues uh, who have some experience with that because actually it's kind of fun to do. Um, you want to make sure your program meets what's called generally accepted IH standards of practice. Um, the uh, AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, uh, has uh, some good recommendations on standards of practice. Uh, any, any CIH should be happy to talk to you about doing that. Uh, once, once we get a program up and running, uh, you need some, some oversight for the program. And typically a third party could be a, per, a colleague of yours from another site uh, who's not intimately familiar with your program uh, to take a look at it and see what's going on. Make sure your monitoring is done properly. If, if you are uh, doing uh, physical hazard or uh, physical agent or chemical exposure monitoring, you want, excuse me, you want to make sure that it's done well and it's done properly and all the documentation is in line. And to help with that, uh, many of the uh, uh, contract laboratories out there have good tutorials online uh, to show you how to work uh, different, different uh, pieces of instrumentation or monitoring equipment. Uh, you want to make sure the quality of your exposure evaluations is, is acceptable. And what does that mean? We'll talk a little bit more about that, but typically the that the method you're using is appropriate, uh, all the quality control steps are taken, um, that your data is, is going to be reproducible and effective. Um, you're going to want to make sure that any recommendations that are provided are based on the facts, um, not, not based on uh, necessarily on assumption, but any recommendations you make should be factually based, let the data speak for itself. And You'll want to develop uh, a periodic, typically you see annual exposure evaluation plans for assessing different, uh, different uh, activities or work practices. Your site supervisors and managers uh, as output from, from your work and as a part of that work you need to really understand the potential health hazards of the work that is being done in their areas. Everybody should know uh, the hazards of the materials they're working with, especially signs and symptoms of exposure and uh, how, to, how their personal protective equipment uh, should be operated. Uh, potential health hazard review should be part of every pre-job safety review. You want to take a look at uh, what you have there and don't be afraid, you know, let your folks know that where they can get help, where they can get assistance from EHS or safety or your IHP uh, people when they're evaluating conditions. If you are a site safety person, um, you need to have a basic level of IH hazard awareness. And I think these days, uh, virtually everyone who's in the EHS field, whether you're primarily safety or environmental or, uh, or IH, uh, everybody should have a basic level of understanding of the other aspects of the work we're doing. So safety people should have a, a fundamental knowledge of, of environmental controls and issues in IH and, and vice versa. And again, always request assistance uh, from an industrial hygiene, hygienist when, when needed for evaluations or, or monitoring. And our role as EHS professionals really is to make sure that all of our employees understand the potential health hazards of what it is they're working with or being potentially exposed to or actually exposed to. Uh, they should all know uh, how to use their PPE and we should be pretty, pretty uh, vigilant in uh, coaching them and helping them to make sure that they, uh, they do a good job with that. And that, and that is a fundamental part of any IH program, whether it's, whether it's explicitly stated or not, is we need to be the champions of uh, helping folks understand those health hazards and controlling uh, and managing those those health hazards. It's all part of the, you guys uh, who, who know safety systems uh, know this uh, this graphic really well, right? Plan, do, check, act. Uh, plan it, do it, check it, verify it, act, start the cycle again, uh, continuously improve what it is that we're, that, that we're doing. So at this time, we've got, oh, we've got a, little, a few minutes left. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about just some comments on 
chemical exposure monitoring. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when, when I started out in industrial hygiene, um, the, the technology was nowhere near where it is now. I mean, I did things like, uh, oh boy, I had to make my own passive disimeters. They were brand new coming out. Um, I had to uh, pack my own gas chromatograph columns uh, to do uh, uh, basically to desorb uh, sorbent tubes. Uh, pretty, pretty antiquated. And the role of an industrial hygienist 30 plus years ago was really uh, as much as uh, as being a chemist as it was uh, being out on the floor and doing anything else. You had to collect your sample, you had to maintain the integrity of the sample, you had to analyze the sample, sample then you had to communicate the results. That's really changed um, and, and I like the change. Uh, now we can get passive disimeters, we can just clip them on a person, very easy, very simple to use, very cost effective, um, where we, we have to use an active sampling methodology. Uh, we have flow controlled pumps that are going to maintain basically uh, proper flow and back pressure while they're uh, doing their job. We have a direct reading ins instrumentation. Uh, you know, four gas meters now are, are so tiny uh, we can just wear them when we're uh, entering hazardous locations. Uh, so our ability to evaluate exposures uh, in the workplace has really, really improved to a high degree. What hasn't changed over the years is exposure levels in the workplace vary considerably with, with location and time. And I've, I've done sampling jobs or sampling rounds where I'll look at the same work shift on different days, or different times or different uh, parts of the year and you're going to see big shifts in uh, uh, the types of exposures that you see. And you, you read in the publications, you know, a, a tenfold variation uh, from one day to another or one worker to another really, really isn't unusual. Uh, and when you consider that all of our, at least our airborne uh, exposures are based on time-weighted average exposures, and you look at the squiggly blue line, if that is the actual exposure to, say, a substance, say, I'm, I'll pick on methylene chloride again today. Uh, if I'm a worker and I'm working with methylene chloride, and the, uh, the green line is my actual time-weighted exposure, the red line is the, uh, the PEL, or the threshold limit value, uh, you can see that most of the time during the day, that blue line is going to be below the TLV or the PEL. And if I took a sample anywhere along that line, the blue line that's below the red line, I take my single sample, I'm going to say, well, the exposure is really low, or maybe it's, it's a little bit high. Uh, if I took a, a single sample where the blue line goes above the red line, and again, I'm going to say, oh boy, I'm out of compliance, uh, where I really am not out of compliance. I'm, I'm in control and I'm below the PEL because of, uh, it is a time-weighted average. So we have to be, we have to be on the lookout for uh, that, that single sample or that single test. Uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this, uh, when I took the sample, is it uh, a high point, a low point? Is it going to vary greatly? And one of the things we need to do, especially when we're setting up a sampling plan, is take enough samples to take care of that variability, um, make sure that, that uh, we, we get a sense of where uh, our exposures are while we're sampling. Working with an IH lab, um, I think all of us who do a, a fair amount of sampling uh, get to like a lab that uh, we're working with, uh, get to like the folks at the lab. Uh, if you're a little new to sampling, or uh, call up the lab, and or you can text back and forth too. Uh, but talk to the lab. Uh, you, you'll find your sampling and the work that you're going to do is goes so much easier when you talk to the folks at the lab about what you're going to do, why you want to do it, what type of uh, uh, testing you want to have done. Uh, they have great advice. Always make sure the lab is AIHA, American Industrial Hygiene Association accredited, um, and not just the lab itself, but it's accredited for the type of work that you need to do. So if you're sampling for chromium, make sure they're accredited for, for chromium. Always follow the established 
procedures and SOPs for your sampling. Uh, talk to the lab. Uh, some labs like uh, Galson have been around a long time. Uh, they have great tutorials. Uh, YouTube videos or downloadable PDFs that you can read and go through before you actually go up and sample. Look at the NIOSH guides. Look at the uh, uh, documentation of the TLVs uh, before you sample and you can see where these tests came from and uh, how best to do that. Calibration and quality control. Uh, one, when we do facility audits or audits of IH programs, one thing that generally we can count on seeing is lack of calibration of sampling equipment, uh, either direct reading instruments or sampling pumps. Um, if you have your own pumps, you always want to have a, uh, uh, a calibrated pump and a uh, verifiable uh, NTIS uh, calibration uh, device, whether it's like a buck calibrator or something like that. Uh, the reason for that is the new pumps are great. If you get a pump from a lab, they'll ship it to you. It's uh, most likely going to be a new flow controlled lab, uh, uh, excuse me, flow controlled pump, uh, nice digital readout, uh, tell you how many, uh, you know, cc's per minute or liters per minute that it has pulled. Uh, you always want to calibrate it. Uh, and the reason for that is the thing has been shipped back and forth. It's been bumped and banged around. The batteries might not be that good. Uh, you want to make sure it's working properly. If your results end up in court, which they may do because these are employee exposure records and 10 or 15 years from the time you took the sample, it might end up in court. You want to have the chain of custody and calibration records intact uh, to make it a valid sample. And so you always want to do your pre and post calibrations. Uh, with your pumps. If you're working with something like a, uh, a PID uh, or a four gas meter, always do a, a pump test or a calibration check with those before you do it and uh, record it. Uh, always keep copies of your records. It's an OSHA requirement uh, that we keep our exposure monitoring records for 30 years uh, beyond employment for people, so we want to make sure that we, we maintain uh, all of those records. They are a legal document and at the end of the day, you know, it, it shows the quality of the work that you have done and uh, it'll be available for other folks to compare their work against. So we always want to look at that. We talked a little bit about variability and I think the, the, the one point I'd like to make here is I have seen a number of, of situations where uh, very, very well-meaning people or companies have made some pretty significant decisions uh, as a result of one sample. And uh, uh, an example I've got it was a uh, electronics manufacturing company. This is a number of years ago. Uh, they had an operation where they were, uh, for security reasons, shredding uh, cir printed circuit boards, printed wiring boards. And printed wiring boards uh, have a lot of heavy metals in them, particularly lead. Uh, they had a site uh, EHS person uh, went around, did some routine lead monitoring, some lead sampling, uh, took one sample, uh, was very, very high. Uh, the, uh, the, the company shut down the plant, uh, shut down the operation, uh, basically did, <laughs> implemented a, a lead cleanup for the site, all as the result of, of one sample. And uh, it turned out, uh, had had they had a proper sampling plan and did some statistics on the sample, uh, it probably didn't need to, to do all that stuff. You know, the, 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 uh, the operation really wasn't out of control. Uh, if you remember back to that curve we had, they took the one sample at a very high peak in that time-weighted average and made a lot of assumptions based on that. So, uh, you know, you always want to be cautious, set up a, a reasonable sampling plan, recognize that that uh, exposures are variable, they're going to vary because of uh, the people who are doing the work, the, the machinery that's doing the work, uh, even the weather uh, that impacts the facility can have, can have an effect of that. So uh, that's, my, that's my little lecture on, on why we should have a, a sampling strategy. Oops. So actually with that, I, I think uh, 
I think we've met our allotted time. So uh, I just want to sum up that industrial hygiene really is, is a multifaceted discipline. Uh, it involves science, engineering, toxicology, med uh, medicine, um, good solid management to get, get to that goal of protecting our, our workers' health. And a risk-based approach is really, um, I think, the most efficient and effective means to identify and prioritize how we're going to do it. Typically, there's so much to do. Uh, we have limited time and limited resources to be able to do that. We really need to pick our, you know, our, our most important uh, actors to go after. Obviously, regulatory compliance is one, uh, and then where we do have significant potential to uh, expose folks to, to different uh, agents is the other. And then uh, keep up with the te technology. Uh, industry is changing. Uh, industry processes are changing. Uh, the, the IH evaluation technology is constantly changing, so uh, keep up with it. Go to trade shows, go to conferences, spend, I, I always like to, uh, uh, when I go to the conferences, spend a little bit of time uh, walking through the trade show area, you know, and just see what's new in the, uh, in the uh, instrumentation and the assessment uh, stuff that we have. You know, there's always something, uh, something that we can learn. So uh, with that, whoop, I'd like to say uh, thanks for attending. And uh, James, do you have a couple of... Uh, couple of comments? I do, I do. So uh, thank you, Mark, first of all, for this presentation. Uh, I know I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. Um, and I ask you to, to stay on if you have the time. We do have 10 minutes or so for questions. Uh, I also want to talk briefly about our follow-up to this webinar and what you can expect in the next couple of days. Um, so I see a few questions. Uh, we have a pretty large audience, so I'll encourage you that we, we do have some time, so go ahead and get your questions in, and we'll do our best to get to those. Um, briefly, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to email you tomorrow morning with a copy of this presentation. I saw a couple of questions come in about that. And you also get a recording to the webinar so you can listen back at your convenience. Um, also in that email will be a, a link to a short survey. Just let us know what you thought of the webinar. I hope it was informative and, and give us any suggestions for improving in the future and any ideas you have. Um, right now we're, we're planning our program for 2017, so let us know um, what you're interested in learning more about. Um, you'll see a link here. Um, our EHS consultants, like Mark, are available to help uh, give you some advice and, and help you plan for a successful industrial hygiene program. Um, we're able to support the implementation and ongoing management of your employees' health and safety. Uh, so for more information, you can visit uh, our website, and there will also be a, a short one-question survey that, that pops up at the end here um, where you can request to speak with an expert. And I'm uh, shooting over that link in the chat box in case you want to take a look uh, at that. And there's Mark's email address. I know he probably won't mind responding, so uh, feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions after digesting the information here today. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Let's, let's get to those questions. Um, the first one is, uh, do you have any tips for getting people to comply? It sounds like you've worked in a lot of facilities. <laughs> Give us a couple tips. What, what do you see work? Uh, one, one thing I found that you know, to help people comply, uh, and, and it's usually with following established procedures uh, or wearing the, the proper PPE, is, is I like to just sit down and talk with them. Um, you know, typically with PPE, uh, I, I work in a lot of places that, that have a lab environment, and uh, you, you'll always find folks, oh, you know, it's tough to get them to wear the lab coats or the safety glasses. And I like to tell people the reason you're wearing your personal protective equipment is not because we're expecting you to be exposed to something, is I can't predict when you're going to be exposed to something. If I could, I, I would only have you wear it when you need to wear it. But the reason you wear the PPE is I don't know when someone's going to drop a beaker of acid, or I don't know when a, a nail is going to shoot out of a nail gun from across the way. So you know, the, try, to, try to understand where they're coming from and give them a good, solid, reasonable answer for doing that. The other thing is, um, talk to the, our managers and supervisors. It's, it's really their role uh, to make sure that their folks are, are following correct procedures and, and doing things safely. So a lot of times, it's not so much the employee you need to convince. You know, it's an employee supervisor or manager. Yeah, that really puts it into perspective. Thanks, Mark. And I, I hope that helps. 
um, as you go and, and try and implement these practices. Do you, we talked a bit about IH labs towards the end. Um, do you any, do you recommend any labs in, specifically, or do you have any more advice for selecting one? I guess building on what we just yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean the you know the big national labs, uh, the SGS Galsons, uh, they're an excellent lab. Uh, I, I like the uh, was these are just personal preferences. I'm not I'm not saying uh, Triumvirate you know recommends them uh, one over the other. Uh, the Wisconsin Occupational Health Lab, which is a state-run lab, is good. Uh, if you're working with pharmaceuticals, uh, Bureau Veritas in Lake Zurich, uh, Illinois, they have they have many many. Um, basically uh, uh, compounds they can test for that they have validated uh, analytical procedures for that other labs don't. Uh, always reach out to your workers' comp insurance carrier. Uh, the big ones uh, like Liberty, Travelers, uh, typically will have an industrial hygiene laboratory. And in many cases, um, you may be able to get your workers' comp insurer to send an industrial hygienist out to your facilities uh, to do assessments for you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Good recommendations there. Um, and we were just talking before the webinar that we, we might follow up on this uh, next year with maybe a, a webinar on sampling strategies, see if we can dive a little deeper there. Um, so stay tuned for that. There is a question here. This one's from Sarah, and it, it's on sampling. We tested for potential chromium exposure in building A. If we have the exact process in building B, do we have to sample in, in that building as well? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, I, would, um, I, I would typically say yes, uh, just because inherent variability, even though it may be an identical process in a very similar building, uh, there could be slight differences in work practices, uh, slight differences in ventilation uh, that could make the the results different. So you know, typically I would say yes, unless they're absolutely you know, mirror image identical. Excellent. And Sarah says, okay, thanks. Appreciate it, Mark. Uh, here we go. A question from Donald. We have just, uh, I'd say, two, two more left. Uh, we might be able to squeeze in one or two more if, if any are out there. Um, his question is, are potential teratogenic impacts uh, considered anywhere within the general industry standards, where might we find information on these risks? Okay, uh, teratogens, uh, mutagens, we're, we're talking about uh, chemicals with uh, typically adverse reproductive outcomes, and uh, uh, a good source of information for that would be uh, uh, through NIOSH, through TOSCA, uh, the, you know, uh, send me an email specifically on what you have you know, I'd be glad to, to point you in some of the some uh, some directions on that. Good, um, excellent. And here we go. One from Stephen. Uh, we have been told that there is not any equipment available to measure HFIP exposure. Do you know of any? Um, tell me what HFIP is. There's so many acronyms. Sorry about that. Yeah, Stephen, if you could if you could type that in, um, we'll get that one out there. And as he's doing that, Mark, <laughs> why don't we finish with a quick, um, can you kind of walk us through what a typical IH audit looks like? Um, sure, sure. Uh, uh, an IH program audit would be, uh, 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 typically we would want to look at uh, your, your uh, risk assessment process. How do you, I, you know, if you're familiar with, with any of the uh, ISO 14,000 strategies, kind of an aspects and impacts. Uh, how do you know what you have and how have you quantified what you have? How did you come up with your listing of, of agents or uh, conditions to be looking at? Uh, I would want to look at a qualitative cut on that. Um, I, I'd want to look at your sampling plan or strategy or your assessment plan and strategy. Uh, is it a one-time kind of evaluated or is it a periodic where you would want to uh, look at things over time? And then if you have an on, ongoing processes, I'd want to look at the, uh, uh, the number of samples you're taking, maybe some statistics around number of samples. Uh, we're, we're getting a little bit beyond this presentation now, but anytime you take a sample, it's going to be a plus or minus uh, error band around that sample. Um, if I'm using a passive dissimilar, it's probably plus or minus 20% of the actual true value. So you need to take a number of samples uh, that statistically are going to even out those those uh, errors 
so that we're getting close to a true a true sample. Thanks for that, Mark. And uh, Stephen got back to us, and uh, I'll do my best not to butcher it. It's hexafluoroisopropanol. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, and, and what was this question again? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, let's revisit that. Uh, but, but, but we have been told that there is not any equipment available to measure exposure. Do you know of any? Uh, offhand, um, no, uh, but I haven't sampled for that. Uh, but uh, I will look it up. And uh, typically, this is one I would call some labs for and, and see if they have a method or see if anyone else has a method uh, for that. But uh, yeah, I will, I will get back to you on that. Great. So from my perspective, it looks like we've taken care of all of the questions. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. We're finishing here right on time. And uh, I hope everyone really enjoyed this presentation. Anything else to add before we shut down? No, I, I would just like to say thank you very much. And I'm, I, I'm really pleased to see you know, so many folks interested in industrial hygiene. So, uh, uh, and uh, feel free, anybody, just, just pop me an email. Uh, I, I would love to, uh, you know, love to see what uh, some of your questions and issues are and uh, hopefully help you out. Sounds good. Thanks for attending, everybody. Appreciate your time and your questions. Really great. Again, please expect that email tomorrow morning. We'd appreciate your feedback. Take care and have a great rest of the day. Bye. Yep. Thanks, guys.